Hello, Will, mate. Hello. How, How are you doing? doing? Yeah. Really good. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us down. That's all good. No, we've got uh, we've got Kobe in the studio as well. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, this has been a long time coming. It has indeed. We uh, we met at Dogstable, and who'd have thought that a, a day out when my dogs would have ended up me being here a few months later, eh? That's it. Yeah, I know. That was a that was a good weekend. We got got quite a lot done, but um. It was more the people that we met there, like yourself, so that's kind of led to led to these kind of conversations. So yeah. It was a really, really good day. Uh huh. And you were there, not just as looking around. You were there to to train as well, weren't you? Um, so we didn't really know. I mean, we we wanted to get a stall, but um, it just been so busy this year with with everything. Um, that we never got round to, um, you know, setting anything up or anything like that. So literally put my uniform on and thought we'll go for a day out with the dogs. And we went out for a day with the dogs and ended up meeting some really, really incredible people uh, and uh, actually picked up a few clients from the festival. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it was, uh, it was a productive day out and we've helped pe uh, dogs and people, you know, off the back of it, which is good. Awesome. Yeah, we kind of both really, really gained a lot from that weekend it was really well laid out for a first time festival dogs tour was it was nicely done yeah definitely i think you know they've uh they, they've done well probably some feedback from some of the traders and people there but um you know onwards and upwards for next year we'd, we'll definitely be getting a pitch there awesome yeah i think we're going to be going back hopefully in the vip tent so to me and if you're if you're watching or listening get me in that vip tent <laughs> uh yeah so will do you want to tell me yeah who you are what you do Certainly, yeah. So, um, I mean, really, this podcast is is about dog behaviour. Um, I'm a, a qualified dog behaviourist through the British College of Canine Studies. I've got an advanced national diploma in it, um, and really, it's an opportunity today to talk about my journey into the world of dog behaviour. Uh, you know, how did I fall into it, um, and then really about working in the world of dog behaviour. Uh, and then finally, uh, answering any questions that I'm sure you've got for me. And I know some of the listeners have, have also, um, you know, put some questions out there. So happy to answer those as well. Amazing. Cool. So how did it all start? Because you haven't been in, in working with dogs your entire career, have you? I haven't indeed, no. Um, so I'm actually qualified to to work with both humans. I know it always sounds weird when I say that, but... I'm I'm um, accredited by Pareto Law to to train, coach, and develop humans, um, as well as being qualified to to work with dogs as well. So suppose really from my point of view, that's when my USP comes in because when you're working with a dog with behavioural problems, it's usually eighty percent training the human and twenty percent training the the dog that actually usually is actually all right. Yeah. Uh, but how did I fall into the world of it? Well, if we go back around about ten years ago. Uh, when I was um, when I was in my early twenties and a, a lot skinnier than I am today, I must say, um, rather naively, we did what most people do, which was, ah, oh, we love bulldogs. Um, let's go and get a bulldog. Um, didn't know the right questions to ask. Um, fell in love with the first bulldog that we saw, and we went to pick up that bulldog. And unknowingly, um, at the time. Uh, when we reflected back on it, of course, it was a puppy farm. So Dukes, uh, bless his soul, is um, is is the the logo of of our business, Calm Down Dogs. So that's actually modelled on a photo that I took of him uh, many years ago. And um, when we went into the property, it was in the middle of nowhere, and there was probably about ten pens um, with all loads of litters in, um, and the the noise in there was horrific. And uh, Dukes, the, the bulldog that we took home, uh, was in a pen on his own. So basically he was eight weeks old. Both of his brothers had died uh, very early on. And the breeder gave um, Dukes uh, a surrogate mother, which was a Shih Tzu. Was he given a surrogate mother? I don't know, because she wasn't there when we went to pick him up. Right. So there we were. Um, and um, we, I just fell in love with this dog straight away. He come bounding over to us shouldn't have paid the money um, that we paid for him. And there's always the debate of whether we should take, um, you know, dogs from a puppy farm or not, which uh, I'll explain in a, a little bit later. Uh, but basically, right then and then, all I wanted to do was get the dog out of the environment and, and, right. and put him into an environment where I felt we could nurture him in the right way. Uh, little did I know that when we got home that evening, uh, Dukes was uh, very aggressive. 
So he attacked me at eight weeks old. He attacked my wife uh, and he also attacked Kobe, uh, our puck. So there we are wanting to bring what you normally see, the, the videos of bulldogs, really docile dogs that are great family dogs. And we've got an eight week old puppy, which is trying to tear us to pieces. Um, so after doing some research, um, spoke to some local uh, dog trainers, vets, behaviorists, and to be fair, most of them told us to put him down um, wow. due to the behaviors that, that he had at such an early age. And um, we, regardless of, of you know what was going on, we fell in love with him. So we ended up finding a trainer that did believe that they could make a difference. So this guy uh, was, uh, was a retired uh, dog trainer. He used to train military and police dogs, sniffer dogs, riot dogs, and all stuff like that. Uh, and pretty much within the hour and a half that I worked with the dog trainer and Dukes, um, we uh, shaped a completely different dog. And um, when I came back from that session, I was walk walking down our road. I phoned my wife up and said, take a look. And she walked out and there's Jukes walking on a loose lead to my side, looking up, checking in all the time. Um, she couldn't believe it. So <clears throat> that's really where I went, wow. You know, when you know what to do, that's how quickly you can shape dog behavior and take a dog that where people are going, put them down. And actually, you can work with that dog and develop it into a dog that, um, you know, is actually okay. Yeah. So we carried on with the training. Um, and then I suppose, you know, I became the unofficial dog whisperer at work. So I used to have a career. I um, used to run a, a very large sales operation. I had, you know, around about 450 odd people reporting into me. Um, of course, there was a large percentage of those people that loved dogs and had dogs. Um, so what I did was, um, you know, don't tell my managing director this. I hope he's not watching it. But I spent a large part of my day walking around talking about dogs. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I really got involved with, um, you know, working with aggressive dogs and, um, you know, working with dogs with behavioral problems, puppy, you know, your, your basic training and stuff like that. Uh, and I loved it. And then, unfortunately, we lost um, Jukes at a very early age. Uh, he had a, a, a tumour in his spine, which was unoperable. Where it was, it was in the base of his spine. Um, and we, we sadly lost him at four years old. Um, and we did what most dog owners do, which is as soon as you lose a dog, you go out and buy another one because the home just doesn't you know, feel the same as it did before. So um, we went and bought Murphy. Um, and uh, Murphy is a, a British bulldog cross with an old-time English bulldog. And uh, lo and behold, uh, after about seven months, he started to develop quite severe separation anxiety. Uh, and he was getting rid of that through destruction. So he completely tore our kitchen to pieces. Oh. <laughs> uh, the architrave around the door. So he chewed a chunk out like that and uh, basically got down to the concrete. Um, and at this point, I'd worked with puppies, general dog training, aggressive dogs, and, and I was pretty au fait with what I was, what I was doing. Uh, but I'd never really dealt with anxiety in a dog before. So in comes uh, behaviorist number two, um, told us all the silly mistakes that we were making, you know, told us the underlying cause of the issue, why it was happening, uh, and gave us a plan of how to recondition it. Uh, fast forward to three weeks later, uh, Murphy was a completely different dog, um, didn't have separation anxiety anymore, and um, we've uh, we've never looked back on it. It's just something that we've never had another issue with him. Um, so it was around about this time that I started thinking to myself, do you know what? I'd really like a career change, and I can see that I've got transferable skills in terms of what I'm doing at the moment. I'm a people person. You know, I'm I'm confident with people. I can develop people, and also I've got a real passion for dogs and and helping. You know, for for anybody who's who's leading a large operation from a sales or from an organisational point of view, um, in order for you to be successful, you have to have a passion in helping people, mm -hmm. and that's always been one of my key strengths. I've always wanted to help people to develop and get better, and I have that exact same relationship with dogs. Um, if I could do it for free, I would do. 
but obviously <laughs> you've got to eat <laughs> i've got to i've got to eat yeah as you can tell <laughs> and um and then yeah so um we, i work with murphy um you know murphy's never ever going to be a hundred percent um if he was at 40 percent when he was tearing the kitchen to pieces we've got him to 90 percent. he's a fantastic dog that people love living with uh, and being around and um it was at that time when i went right i'm gonna break off from what i'm doing um studied really really hard on my qualification um and uh the the rest is history calm down dog was born um and uh and and now i'm lucky enough to spend most of my days working with dogs who um who need a bit of help awesome so you're still sort of in a transition period you're still doing a bit of both aren't you as far as careers are concerned but you mainly working with dogs exactly yeah so um you know i i still travel um i say i still i now travel all over the world uh training and developing humans so ideally i only want to do one week a month of that and then you know three to four weeks um you know really focusing on the dog behavior it so one week in every four to six um, weeks, uh, I will uh, be anywhere in the world. So this year I've been to uh, Nigeria. I've been to Utah three times uh, in Provo, Salt Lake City. I've been to Boston. I've been up and down the UK. I've been to Romania. Um, and later in the year, I'm going to Tokyo and Melbourne. So <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I get around doing that. But um, as much as I, I have a passion for that and it's great fun, um, after a few days, I miss working with dogs and, uh, that's where my real passion lies. And, um, you know, I think I'll always do the human side of it training, but you know, my, my go-to and my passion is, is developing calm down dog as a business and, and helping people through that. That's amazing. Um, you know, you get to travel at, at such sort of spaced out intervals as well. So I guess that's what makes it a bit more special. Exactly. Yeah. Going back to when you were in the rescue shelter with Dukes and, uh, you know, you went in there because you wanted to bring a pup into your life. But as soon as you got there, you quite soon realised that you wanted to take him out of that situation. Like it, it kind of spanned there and then, didn't it? Uh, we have got a question from a lady called Sally who messaged me on Facebook. She's looking to get a dog and she is seriously considering rescuing a dog. Um, which is great to hear, um, but she is concerned about the added work it might come with. What would you say to that? Uh, I would say if you're concerned about the added work, um, don't do it. Um, and I would also say if you're concerned about investing time in a dog, then don't get a dog from a breeder either. Um, you know, you can have, um, you know, if, if you look at our dogs, for example, Kobe, our pug, the calmest and most balanced dog that you'll ever meet. And, um, you know, I'll be completely honest with you, I've hardly done any training with him. <laughs> he has the best recall that you will ever find in a dog. It is pinpoint accuracy and it is to the money sharp every time. I probably spent about 20 minutes of my life doing recall training with him. Um, Murphy, every single day we have to work with that dog to keep him calm and balanced. Uh, two of his brothers have been put down due to aggression. Uh, a lot of his behavioural problems are driven from uh, the litter. So his mum was a very nervous dog. Um, she never disciplined the pups. <clears throat> Murphy was the biggest in the litter. He was basically the bully. Um, got away with murder. So when we took him on, um, he had a lot of issues as well. Um, and then Rex was a rescue that we took on back in January. Uh, incredibly prey-driven Back in January, if he saw a cat, he lost the plot. I've never seen a dog react in that way. And I'm like, why is it always my dog? <laughs> um, but, you know, six, seven months on now, um, he's really, really calm and balanced. But I've put so much work into him. So, you know, my advice is regardless of whether it's a rescue or whether you're getting a dog off of a breeder, unless you are prepared to work with that dog to get them into a, a stage in life where they're calm and balanced, my advice would be don't get a dog. Yeah, that's great advice. And you talking about Murphy and, and his antics in, in the litter, that's important as well. It's not a case of, you know, that's the dog, it looks cute, it's approached me first out of the rest. It's crucial you understand the dynamics as far as where it's come from. Exactly. The mother, the siblings, 
um, it's it's vital. It, it is vital, and um, you know now ha having worked with you know thousands of dogs, um, people phone up and say I've got an anxious dog. I think it was the runt of the litter. Well, the runt of the litter tends to always be anxious, and it's very rare that you're going to get that dog to ever be a hundred percent comfortable in all environments. Um, you know, pe people see dogs as a reflection of themselves, so you tend to find that quite anxious. Um, amiable people want to help those dogs out. Then you have your big extroverts, your big characters, where, well, yeah, let's go and pick up a dog. Of course, whenever I work with those dogs that are usually hyperactive, crazy, high energy levels, um, the uh, the owner's like, oh, you know, when we went to go and pick him up from the breeder, you know, he chose us and or she came running over to us and jumped all over us. Well, guess what? That's mm. why you've got a dog that's hyperactive and so forth. So, <laughs> you know, my advice to people is it really depends what you want. You know, those hyperactive, those high energy dogs, the crazy ones, they still need a home. So if you can give it the right home, absolutely fine. You can shape it to become calm and balanced. Um, and the anxious dogs, well, they still need a home as well. So if you're willing to invest the time and give them the right influence, then absolutely brilliant. If you want a dog that's not really going to cause you a lot of issues and going to slot into your life quite perfectly my advice is always ask the breeder what's the middle of the road dog what's the dog that kind of sits there and goes i'll take it or leave it mm -hmm. um and usually when you then work with those dogs they're the dogs that are just the easiest dogs to work with um so it really depends on on the owner and what they're looking for um you know, to answer the question that, that that was out there earlier on in terms of puppy farms, you know, I don't blame people from buying dogs from puppy farms. What I blame is that the dog industry is an unregulated industry. In fact, the pet industry is an unregulated industry. It's not the consumer's fault. It's not the owner's fault. It's the fact that we need to put rules and regulations in place so that breeders breed dogs in a proper in a proper environment. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that there are puppy farms out there. So rather than looking at the people that are running these, it shouldn't be. What we need to look at is the dogs that need our help. Mm -hmm. So until we fix the problem from a legality and a regulation point of view, these dogs still need a home. And, you know, I know a lot of people would debate the way that I, I, I view that. But for me, um, something needs to happen in terms of us regulating the dog industry so that we so that consumers and owners can trust that what they're buying into is actually what they should be buying into yeah you're absolutely right it's very much a cultural shift that needs to happen i think it's i think it's on its way considering all the things that are happening with uh, like lucy's law and, and and finn's law things are getting stricter as far as uh, dogs are concerned yeah but yeah, uh, certainly every every dog you get, it's not like it comes out the box preset blank. Definitely it's, not. It's very much. Like and, unless it's Kobe, <laughs> you know, you, you strike gold with them. And, you know, quite often um, I will go around to people's houses and, you know, their, their new dog's called Dexter and their old dog was called Rainbow. And they sit there and go, but Rainbow was a Labrador and Rainbow never did this and Rainbow never did that. And Rainbow was just brilliant. And I'm like, right, let's stop focusing on Rainbow. Yeah, you struck gold with Rainbow. Well done. <laughs> you had an easy life. Now we need to focus on Dexter. Dexter needs a different relationship to what Rainbow did. That's it. Yeah, constantly adapt. Sorry, I'm finding it quite hard to focus. We've got Kobe and Ivor fighting through our cat flap Excellent. all morning. <laughs> <laughs> so as a behaviourist, what, uh, what route did you go down and what approach do you take um, as far as uh, your, your rewards um when when you when you train dogs yeah so that's a really good question and i don't think um many people can really answer that question until they're experienced in working in the field so um i reached out to the behaviorist that i worked with because i really liked her approach um it very much suited the type of approach and relationship that we had with dogs so uh, i went to the british college of canine studies um and uh, and worked with them and, and they're amazing um, a lot of the qualifications you do, it's very process driven and it's like form filling. Dogs with behavioural problems are not process driven animals. Um, what works with some dogs does not work with other dogs. Mm 
Um, so, you know, I really, really appreciated the way that they allowed me to bring in my own experiences and my own, um, you know, way of dealing with dogs. Um, and, um, yeah, I did my qualification with them, um, did practical plus theory based ones. Um, and, uh, you know, they've also been great following the comp consultation, you know, even today, sometimes there'll be a really unique situation. I think, do you know what, before I fully give advice on this, I want to just double check that I'm on the right path and I'll communicate with them um, and just make sure that, you know, we're do we're giving the dog exactly what they need in order to get to where we want to get to. Um, you know, your next question was what approach do I use? Mm -hmm. um, I suppose I don't really kind of sit here and go, this is my approach. Um, there are some dogs that I positively reward train. Um, Kobe is a dog that's positively reward trained. I mean, you know he's he's he just does that uh, and that works really really well with some dogs uh there are other dogs that i use a much more balanced approach um what do we mean by balanced approach well when you're working with a very stubborn bulldog staffy mastiff when you're working with an, a, a very reactive or an aggressive mastiff um i don't see a lot of results from positive reward only training those dogs um, and again, this opens up a whole debate, a huge um, debate, a huge debate. Um, I take on, all I can say is I take on a lot of business from people that say I've been working with a dog trainer or a behaviorist for a long time. I don't really feel like the methods are working. My dog's not interested in food. It doesn't want to look at a ball when it's reacting. It's not, um, you know, it's not, it's not responding to the, to the training. Um, and quite often within an hour, uh, working with those people by introducing the right equipment, uh, the right collars, the right leads, the right influence, um, that dog is not reactive anymore. Uh, and quite often with those dogs, we use no food and no toys. Um, so the way that I see it is you've seen two dogs playing down the park. They play pretty rough. Yeah. As long as you never go above that level, it's perfectly natural in the canine world for them to communicate with that sort of force yeah um i never go to that level if you look at two staffies playing i never correct a dog that much um, but that tells us the level that we can go to with those breeds um would i be comfortable and correct to using more force with a staffy than a chihuahua of course i would yeah you have to deal with chihuahuas in a different way that you do with a big dog de bordeaux or something like that yep um and um you know all I can say for, for all of the people out there that are positive reward only training and, uh, and maybe disagreeing with what I'm saying right now, I speak to my clients where I've corrected their dog on a lead and ask them whether they think it was inhumane. Uh, and I guarantee you 100% of them will say no. I've never hurt dogs. I'm never aggressive with them. I'm never really forceful with them. I just understand that sometimes they need that level of correction. Um, and you know, the other thing as well is that the, what we've got to remember with the positive reward only training is that a lot of this is driven from, um, guide dogs, guide dogs are, are positively reward, um, only trained. Um, but we also have to remember that probably only around about 25% of them qualify. Mm -hmm. So there's a much larger chunk of them where the positive reward only training doesn't get them to where they need to get to. Is that all down to the training? Of course not. Something like the runt of the litter that's quite anxious is probably never going to make a guide dog. But if you look at that 50% to 75%, well, it hasn't worked with them in the way that we wanted it to work. Um, and they need a slightly different approach. And that's really where I take it from. I think, you know, the world has gone quite crazy on it because when you hear positive reward only training, you go, well, that sounds really humane and that's amazing. And of course, I'm really bought into that. Brilliant for some dogs. Um, but some dogs need that level of correction. And again, if we go back to the canine world and look at what they do, when the pup is around about four to five weeks old and they start developing teeth, the mum doesn't want that pup anywhere near her nipples anymore. And most of the time, they start acting quite aggressive and they start mm -hmm. snarling, snapping, chucking their pup away from them because they don't want sore nipples. Um, so if in the canine world, it's perfectly natural for the mum to go get away from me and use some force, 
then surely in a dog owner relationship, it's perfectly natural for us to be able to use some form of correction as long as it's not injuring or hurting the dog. So that is how I view dog behavior. I don't go in with any particular approach. I look at the dog, the breed specific needs, and I work out on the day what that dog needs from me in order to get us to where we want to get to. Yeah, it's yeah, it's important to stay open minded. I think uh, and it's also important we have these sort of conversations as well, um, open minded conversations about the different techniques. And it's clear you've got results, um, and you're working with dogs that may have had different approaches used on them and they haven't worked so it's not like we're working with a blank slate if you go with a puppy you know there's a chance that the positive methods only will you know you'll see results but like you say you do need you do need to teach boundaries at some point and if we think about it so positive reward only um if you're walking your dog on a lead, that's not positive reward because actually you're putting in a form of punishment. You're, so in the dog's world, pos positive is is adding something yeah, to stop a behavior and negative is the, the lead that you've, or the choker chain or whatever you're using, which you put around the dog's neck, rather than the dog getting a tug on it, they stop pulling, so it's then known as negative. Um, so, you know, if you really wanted to get anal about it and look at the positive reward only world, it's impossible to have a relationship with a dog where it is pure positive only. Because if I say to a dog, no, that's not positive reward only training, you know, mm -hmm. I'm now starting to use my tone of voice and my, vo and my voice to, um, you know, to correct a dog. Okay. So we could go into that a little bit more, uh, and we will do, but do you want to talk to me about the five foundations of uh, how a dog is shaped, how a dog learns. Of course, yeah. So really, in terms of shaping dog behaviour, there are there, there are five foundations that, that, that we look at at Calm Down Dog. Um, and, you know, from experience, if you get the right balance in all of those five areas, it's very rare that a dog continues to have behavioural problems. Or it's very rare that you can't get that dog to a level where they can live in society and in, in, in you know in and and cope within society so what are the five foundations uh, diet exercise mental stimulation owners influence and environment um and you know if you want me to go into a little bit more detail about um, each area, feel free to you know to ask me questions on them. But when you get the right influence in those five foundations, um, we shape really, really calm and balanced dogs. Okay, uh, we're we're definitely going to go into diet more specifically. We'll do a whole other podcast on that. Yeah, really interested on in that. Um, let's talk a little bit about environment because that is twenty four seven. That's mm -hmm. that's that's constant. Uh, what would you consider to be a good environment? I know that's a very vague question, but uh, yeah, what would you consider to be a, a good environment for, for your dog? Okay, so um, let me talk about it from a behavioural point of view. So I think sometimes I get in conversations with people that have got dogs that have never needed to work with a trainer or a behaviourist. Brilliant. I spend my life around dogs with behavioural problems, mm -hmm. yeah? Um, so it's almost like somebody who spends their life around people that have got addictions and maybe haven't had the best start in life and, you know, they've got mental or psychological problems. Um, so I always talk about it from a, I know that if this environment, if a dog is put in this environment, it can affect a lot of dogs in the wrong way. So the first thing for me from an environmental point of view, um, really simple never have a dog sleeping with you always have a dog um sleeping at the back of the house um a lot of territorial aggressive aggressive dogs that i work with sleep at the top of the stairs by the front door or at the foot of their owner's bed psychologically that dog is first line defense between the owner and the front door all night some dogs that really affects and they become aggressive so get a dog sleeping in a room on their own at the back of the house so that you've never got that problem um, you know, it's great to crate train dogs. If you crate train a dog, put a cover over it so they can't see out of the crate. Um, and don't put it by a window. 
<laughs> unless it's a really big lazy mastiff that would actually benefit from looking out of a window all day because they're not reactive but the amount of houses that i've gone around where i'm working with a, 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 a reactive aggressive jack russell chihuahua terrier and the owners put the crate by a window all day and go out and that dog who's prey driven is looking at birds and squirrels and getting really stressed because it can't get to them dogs do not understand glass yeah <laughs> the party is always the other side and the big frustration for them is they can't smell through the grass, uh, through the glass. Um, so it for, for for a lot of dogs it really winds them up. Um, so what happens is that dog stressing itself out all the time. Every time it gets stressed, it gets a release of cortisol into its bloodstream, um, and then um, you know if that just happens every now and then after about an hour, fifty percent of the cortisol's gone. Um, when it's constantly going through them that cortisol can stay in the bloodstream for up to three months mm -hmm. so this is why a lot of dog uh, dogs that are in rescue homes and haven't had the best start in life um, they can be quite stressed for a good few months when when they get into a calm and balanced environment um, so you know what we need to do is understand that dogs in the wild yeah would be living in dens um, and you've also got to ask yourself you know why are when you look at a, a, a dog handler car, the dog handler unit, it's got no windows in it. Why do you think it's got no windows in it? Because they don't want the dog to react to anything. Yeah, no stimulation. No stimulation for those dogs. And also, general public will just walk up, oh, hello, look at that lovely dog. Yep. And undo, <laughs> undo all of the hard work that the, uh, you know, the very talented, um, you know, handlers and trainers in the military and the police you know all the work that they've done they, they kind of undo that so um you know all of this all of the simple things which i'll let you talk about i know you're very passionate about you know puppy um you know safety and stuff like that in the house but um all of the simple stuff like ex escape through uh, escape proof garden um and um you know just making sure that you know the 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 dog is in an environment where it's safe of course you know it's common uh, common sense that we do that um if you've got things like huskies and um you know those those sorts of um dogs um quite often they want to see over the gate so build a stand or something for them in the middle of the garden so that they can actually get on top of the mountain and look at what's going on um you know we've we've uh, introduce tables into those sort of environments before and just by doing that and allowing the husky to suss out what's going on has completely changed all of the unwanted behaviors that they've got elsewhere yeah it's just allowing it to tap into its what it would do naturally behavior exactly what it would do naturally so you know from an environmental point of view um you know other things like you know, when you're out in the car, not having a dog on your lap, the amount of aggressive chihuahuas and Yorkshire Terriers and Dachshunds that I work with, um, you know, if they react and you're holding that dog um, and they're barking, barking is a form of aggression. As we know, it's on the canine aggression ladder. And what that owner does is they reward that behavior. So, you know, always have a dog in the boot or on the back seat away from the human so that we don't, um, you know, condition any of those unwanted behaviors uh, in there. Um, and, um, you know, glass is a really big thing. Um, the amount of aggressive, territorial aggressive dogs that I work with, I turn up to the house, beautiful house, beautiful bay window. Um, and what's happening every day is um, there's people walking past the house. The dog jumps up on the sofa, bark, 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 bark. The threat goes away. Uh, another person comes up, walks past, bark, 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 threat goes away. I call it postman syndrome. This is the reason why so many postmen get bitten. <laughs> <laughs> because what happens is they walk up the driveway, the dog barks, they put the letters through the letterbox, and then a second later they walk off. The yeah. dog believes that the barking has got the threat to go away. That happens six days a week, 365 days a year. and Sorry, 52 weeks a year. And... Um, what happens is the dog is gaining confidence for aggression, yeah? Um, and it's every time it happens, it gets that win going, yeah, my barking, which is my form of aggression, has got you to go away. Yep. So that one time when the, the front door's slightly open and they've got that opportunity to go out and bite the postman on the bum, 
that is the reason why so many postmen get bitten. So, dangerous um, job. <laughs> yeah, dangerous dog job, yeah. So, you know, from that point of view, um, if you've got a reactive dog, do not allow them access to the bay window. Uh, I've been to work in some beautiful houses out in the New Forest, um, and these houses have just got floor to ceiling windows, glass, bifold doors across the whole of the back of the house. Of course, there's loads of animals out there. Um, and every time the dog sees a squirrel or a rabbit or anything else that's in the garden, it's reacting to it. Um, and sometimes I've pretty much walked into those houses and gone, how much do you want to move? <laughs> because your house is basically made of glass and this is really adding to the frustration of the dog and really winding your dog up. So what do you do in that situation? What do we do in that situation? So we need to go through desensitization processes, first of all. We need to block off the glass. So whether that's they put a card up on the glass um, or something so that they can't exhibit those behaviours. Mm -hmm. um, and then once we start to get the cortisol out of the dog, we can start to work with the dog. If a dog is really, really motivated at barking at something out the window, you're probably not going to stop that barking straight away. So we find the, somewhere else where the dog starts barking. We control that barking, stop, reward, stop, reward, stop, reward. And then it's transferable when we come into a place where the dog starts to get a lot more aggressive in terms of their dog tone and so forth. Um, and then we start to control it there. Really, with any aggressive dog, um, it's a change in the relationship between the dog and the owner. Because if the dog if the dog owner has the leadership needed for that dog, they can turn the aggression on and off. Um, that's why you can have a, a highly aggressive attack dog or riot dog um, who is never aggressive around humans or other dogs. Because the leadership between the dog and the handler is Premier League. I mean, it's the creme de la creme. Mm -hmm. It's the best of the best. And they go... Aggressive. Rawr. By the way, all that German Shepherd's doing it for is a bit of cheese, which is always quite comical <laughs> when you think of it. And then they go, stop. And the dog stops. It's majestic to see it, isn't it? It is very. When they know. whip them out of the van and the dogs are so tense and ready to go, but they're so in tune with the owner. It's... Yeah. And they've, they've, they can turn it on and off, on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off. And do we need our domesticated dogs that we live in our home to get to that level, of course we don't. They're Premier League. They're, they are the World Cup final winners. But within domestic dogs, if we can get that leadership to Sunday League football, you've got a dog that's not aggressive anymore. So we're sort of um, bleeding into um, owner influence from environment. Um... Owner's influence, yeah. Um, I, before we go, though, I don't know whether you want to talk about puppy safety at all from an environmental point of view. It's oh, up to you. I could talk about environment for hours. I run a daycare, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's... So maybe it's another podcast. Yeah, I definitely think we could talk about it in, in real depth. Uh, environment's everything. Uh, I have to check. I've got quite a large environment. It's mainly outdoors, so there are a lot of <laughs> birds. You know, mm -hmm. we've got um, kites that fly over on a regular basis. My auntie brings two little Jack Russells to me and they tend to swoop down quite low and sets all the dogs off. You know, that's completely out of my control. So yeah, I'm working with them uh, <laughs> to desensitize them to kites, which isn't easy. It's, uh, <laughs> but keeping the environment safe, uh, secure. And obviously, you know, like you said, the Huskies do want to look over. So I've put a set of platforms in the middle. It elevates the dogs and they absolutely love it. Um, everything's six foot, everything's secure, everything's got three, four bolts, we've got three or four gates to get into one. It's, yeah, environment, yeah. OCD. <laughs> but yeah, definitely another podcast. But owner influence. Owner's influence, indeed, yeah. it's a huge one. Um, so, Caesar Milan, very, very controversial, very hands-on. Do I use that level of correction with dogs? No, um, he's he he's very hands on with dogs that are perfectly capable of having you know positive reward only training. The one thing that he absolutely nails and that I've got full respect for him for is calm, assertive leadership. I say it again: calm, assertive leadership. Um, and if you can have that relationship with your dog and you learn what calm, assertive leadership is, um, 
your dog will more you know more likely be very very calm and balanced so um it may surprise you that back in the days when i did my qualification i had to do a whole unit around um human personality types and characteristics so human psychology not dog psychology mm -hmm. quite often when i am working with uh, an anxious or an aggressive dog i turn around to the owner and i say right describe the type of person that you are and what that person is actually doing is describing their dog because dogs become a reflection of us um, and, a, and even a reflection of society. So owner's influence is massive. Anxious people tend to have anxious dogs. Anxiety very quickly spills over to aggression in dogs so they can also have an anxious dog which is choosing aggression to deal with the anxiety. Um, you know, owners that um, put no rules and boundaries in place um, unfortunately usually shape aggressive dogs so whenever I'm working with an aggressive dog usually I'm dealing with the most amiable lovely family couple or anything that you've ever met but because there's no rules and boundaries in place the dog becomes confused and feels like it's the pack leader um, and starts feeling like instinctually it needs to protect and direct the pack so just by having some really simple rules like own the sofa don't allow your dog to just jump up on the sofa and get a cuddle for two hours mm -hmm. anything that the dog finds reward in get the dog to work for it control the foods um, control the food make them earn it pick up the food bowl when they're done with it that kind of thing exactly anything that they find rewarding a thirsty dog will do a sit stay for a bowl of water because at that very moment in time it's rewarding so it's all about looking at dogs. You know, some dogs um, are really motivated by eye contact. I've trained dogs through eye contact and not food. Um, so I make the dog work for the eye contact. Yeah, some dogs are food motivated. Some dogs are toy motivated. Some dogs are motivated by chasing things. Some dogs are motivated by having a cuddle or a back massage. It's about finding out what they, they're motivated by. But the biggest bit of advice is get them to do something for it. What happens with um, when you don't do it is, every, and it's so subtle the way that this happens in terms of dominance in dogs. Every time that dog just comes up to you and gets a stroke, it goes, ha, ah, I've got what I want. It receives something called biofeedback. Um, so um, it jumps up on the sofa, gets a cuddle, biofeedback, comes up to you, gets a stroke, biofeedback. I've met houses that I've been around where the dog scratches at the door the owner goes, oh, I'm really sorry. Um, the dog wants a treat. I've got to go and get it a treat. What? The dog is controlling the the, the food cupboard. Um, and, you know, when you multiply that over a six to nine month period and they've received all of this biofeedback, this is usually when the dog starts to, if it is going to, become dominant aggressive. And it's where the dog's confused because the dog just believes that it needs to protect and direct the pack. Um, and, you know, most of the time, dogs with behavioural problems, 95% of the time, they're the most incredible dog ever. And it's that 5% where they just go bananas, which is scary for the owner and the reason why I'm bought in. So, um, you know, my advice to people from an owner's influence point of view is um, if you're not calm and balanced yourself work with a reputable trainer or behaviorist who can basically work with you and tell you exactly what that individual dog your individual dog needs in order to become calm and balanced and work with them from the day that you pick that dog up i don't care if you're an experienced dog owner and you've had great dogs before you know whenever you invest into a dog you're investing into their life um and why not why not learn some stuff from a behaviorist i guarantee every single client regardless of how many dogs they've had that they will learn a whole list of things through working with me yeah i like that word invest because that is exactly what it is you know yeah. you shouldn't have to wait around for the problem to surface uh to have to reach out to a behaviorist if you get one in early you're investing in that dog and that money you've spent it might seem like a lot uh it works and it's gonna it's that that experience is going to 
stay with you for the for the whole of the dog's life and all of yours to 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 bring into the next dog if yeah. you go into one. You know, and the the amount of times I've had people turn around to me going, oh, I just wish I knew this before. You know, a, a previous dog that had separation anxiety, and now they're working with a dog that's got really bad separation anxiety. Oh, if only we'd have known that, she'd have been such a happier dog. And, yeah. Um, you know, it's it's you know invest in them and 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 shape them the way that they need to be shaped. So, you know, owners' influence is is really really key. Um, the amount of people who say to me, I, I cannot believe how quickly my dog's learned to trust you. Uh, I can't I can't believe you're walking my dog and it's not trying to attack other dogs on the lead. Um, all dogs ever known from me from the moment I walk into their house is calm, assertive leadership. So the reason why dogs gravitate to me when I'm working with them, it's not because I'm a magician. It's not because I know the tricks of the trade or anything like that. I suppose you could call them the tricks of the trade. It's purely because I take the stress out of the dog by becoming the leader. Mm -hmm. um, and of course they want to follow that because they've got all this cortisol going around in their bloodstream and they don't want that. You know, wild wolves and dogs live in harmony most of the time. It's very rare that they are... Um, you know, that they're aggressive. It's only when they're challenged. These poor domesticated dogs feel like they're getting challenged every day, 10 times a day, 50 times a day. It's very, very stressful for them. Um, so, you know, making sure that we, you know, we work with owners to make sure that, that their energy is um, where it needs to be. And, you know, if I may just talk about a very quick story about our rescue dog Rex in terms of owner's energy and how yeah. much it can affect it. Um, so before Rex, I've always had quite cute looking dogs, bulldogs, pugs. Um, Murphy kind of trots over to people. He doesn't let threaten in. And uh, from a dog walker perspective, I've never had an issue with them going over and saying hello to other dogs. In comes Rex. I suppose you could say that he looks like quite a big pit bull. Uh, he's not a pit bull. He's uh, a, probably something like a cane corso crossed with like a staffy. But he looks menacing. <laughs> Sometimes for a laugh, I put a chain lead on him. I've got my tattoos <laughs> out and I go for a walk with him and people cross over the other side of the road. <laughs> Um, and Rex has uh, a tendency, still quite quite young, he's still, you know, class him as a puppy, and he'll bound over to um, other dogs. And I've really picked up on the body language of the other dog, uh, sorry, of the other owner. They panic. Without them knowing, they let off this stress pheromone, this stress hormone, which in the dog's world absolutely reeks. Um, and um, because they're worried that Rex is going to tear their beloved dog apart. Uh, and as a result, the dog then attacks Rex. So very quickly, I saw uh, Rex get attacked three or four times in the space of a month. And I was like, what's going on here? Why is this happening? Uh, and then, of course, over time, I started reading the body language of the other owner. So now I very much pick up on the body language of other owners if they look anxious. I do Rex a favour, I call him into Hill and we just walk past them so that he's never put in that environment where he could get attacked. Um, so, you know, that that the, the anxiety that a lot of owners give off, if there's not that leadership in the relationship, it drives the dog to think that they need to protect and direct the pack. And that's the reason why we have a, a lot of issues with reactive dogs. That's it. Yeah. So as soon as like the lead jerks or, you know, the person gets stiff, the dog's looking up at them like, uh, are you going to do something or do I have to, you know? Yeah. And it's, you know, it's quite common as well for, for us to get results really, really quickly on a consultation because I'm instantly calming the owners down. I'm working with my dogs. I've got three dogs that we work with, with aggressive and reactive dogs. Um, and I, I instantly calm the situation down. We're all talking in this type, type of tone of voice and the owner's very relaxed and guess what? Their dog becomes react. Mm. So we get really good results. Um, as much as I try to preempt this, it's very common for those that same person to phone me three days later and gone, oh, they're reacting again. They've just gone for another dog. And I'm like, listen to you right now. Listen to your state of mind. Listen to your emotions were you like this on the day no i wasn't right how do we get you there and there's some really t simple tips um there's um you might think it's a little bit crazy visualization getting an anxious dog owner to visualize that they are the most confident dog owner in the world 
Tell me it. I'm the most confident dog owner in the world. Tell me again. I'm the most confident <laughs> dog owner in the world. Tell me again. I'm the most confident dog owner in the world. You know, and then they step out with that dog on the lead and they're like raring to go. And guess what? The dog hardly ever reacts. Yeah, he's looking up at them like, oh God. You, <laughs> you know, it's very common it. for me to turn around to people and go, right, what music do you love? Someone might go, house music. Excellent. Here's some headphones. Crank your iPhone, your iPod up, full blast. Put the music in. Forget you've got a dog. Um, and uh, and just walk out there and pretend that you're front line of a festival and you're seven strong bows deep. <laughs> Party for one. <laughs> Way, here we go. And they walk off with that dog down the road or the high street. And guess what? The dog doesn't react anymore. Yeah, yeah. I think this is a, a, a podcast in its own, you know. Probably, yeah. yeah <laughs> remaining calm or how to be calm and assertive, yeah. Yeah. So what's next? Um, so with diet, we're doing on another podcast. Uh, exercise. Uh, exercise won't take me that long to walk. Uh, to, excuse the pun, to walk through, to talk through. Oh, God. <laughs> um, it's as simple as this. Regardless of what breed you've got, if you're giving them the right levels of mental stimulation, um, dogs don't have to have more than 45 minutes off lead exercise every day. So even a husky does not need 45 minutes off lead exercise every day. We condition the level of fitness into our dogs. Um, so one of the things mistakes that people will make with something like a Husky or a Rhodesian Ridgeback is they get them and they go, amazing, let's go for four hour walks every day. And then they really struggle to keep that up. Um, and then when they start to drop back, the Husky's conditioned for four hours of fitness every day. And a little bit like if you just locked up an Olympic athlete mm. in a prison cell, they'd probably lose the plot. That's it, your kitchen gets destroyed. Exactly. So as long as that dog is getting the breed-specific mental stimulation that it needs, which we're going to talk um, about later, um, as long as it's getting... It's a psychological need for them to have at least 45 minutes off lead exercise every day. Uh, as long as we do structured walks, the dog's walking on a loose lead, it's walking to our leadership... Um, we don't allow the dog when they're on the lead to sniff, to mark, to go to the toilet. They can do all of that stuff when they get let off. Um, and then they get let off and they go and do their their thing. And, you know, that really from an exercise point of view, it doesn't need to be any more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. um, amount of people that I have phoning me going, it's got to the point where we're walking the dog for three hours a day and then it's still coming back and tearing the house to pieces. And I'm going, you could walk it for nine hours a day and it'll want to walk for nine hours more. Dogs are perfectly capable of walking or running 200 kilometers in one sitting. Um, so what we need to do with those dogs is yes, the, the exercise is very important, but what's more important is the mental stimulation. Uh, and if it's okay with you, I'll lead on to mental stimulation now. Yeah, yeah, I was just, yeah, consistency is super important. Uh, exactly, yeah. Um, and on the physical side of it as well just i'd say something people like to throw balls for their dogs and you know it's now coming to light just how much detriment that's doing as far as like uh joints mm -hmm. uh, are concerned and and yeah arthritis arthritis that it leads to and um, basically yeah, following on from what you said you can throw a ball for your dog until it's absolutely you know puffing out of its ass the next time you throw the ball, you've got to throw it three more times and the next time three more times. And by the time, you know, a few months down the line, your dog can chase that ball for like 45 minutes. Yeah. Uh, and, and like you say, take a Sunday off, give it a quick five minute walk and then you've got a problem. That problem. Yeah. Um, and also it's super, super like a high arousal exercise rather mm -hmm. than uh, low arousal. But yeah. yeah. My opinion. Okay, so the ball thrower is known in the dog behaviour world as the crazy stick um, because it sends dogs, some dogs crazy, a lot of dogs crazy, I should say. Um, so what's my opinion of them? Well, don't rule them out because for some dogs, they're absolutely brilliant. You know, maybe you are working with a dog that um, needs that burnout because they're not trained to be off lead so maybe we can find a, a small enclosed space where we can burn that energy off for 10 or 15 minutes because it serves a purpose at that time for that particular dog to help from a behavioral point of view long term no not great um but you've got to look at the body language of the dog 
So if the dog is going crazy, rah, 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 chuck the ball, rah, tails all over the place, literally shaking with excitement like this, don't use a crazy stick. Use a ball, get the dog controlled, calm, do self-control training with the dog, calmly throw the ball, get the dog to sit and wait before they're allowed to go and get the ball and use the ball in that way. So that way they're getting some exercise and some mental stimulation. But you know, they're, you know, every week I'll see, uh, you know, maybe a Labrador and they're just calmly, they're throwing the ball, trotting over, pick up the ball, bring it back. You know, you look at the body language of that dog and I go, well, that's not a problem in my world. Mm. So, you know, you've got to look at what's going on with the individual dog and what the individual dog's needs are. The thing with the crazy sticks is that because you're constantly rewarding that hyperactive mind, that crazy mind, um, over a period of time with some dogs, they will become aggressive because they go from literally zero to a thousand percent within seconds and they're constantly getting rewarded for it. So it, it it's the it's the self control part of the ball thrower for me from a behavioural point of view, which is the really important bit. Yeah, from a yeah. health point of view, it's not good for a dog to be bolting after that ball for an hour every single day of their life. They will have health issues later on in life. For five or ten minutes, not a problem. And again, I think this is really where it comes down to the owner speaking to somebody who understands what's going on with the crazy sticks, the ball throwers, the throwers, and being able to educate them in terms of what their ind their dog needs are, the individual needs of that dog. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they just look at it as, you know, the tail's wagging, the dog's engaged, the dog's tired, job done. But there's, yeah, like I said, there's so much more going on. And yeah. having run the daycare for six years you know i made a lot of mistakes in my early years where it was very much like every dog would get a walk and then i'd burn off the rest with the with the crazy stick um without really taking into consideration the different breeds what that ball meant to each individual dog and again not practicing that yeah. uh, calm uh impulsive uh, less impulsive behavior but you know ryan it really goes back to the dog industry once again being unregulated and being driven by marketing. So, you know, you think how many crazy sticks, how many hundreds of thousands or millions of crazy sticks are bought every single day around the world. Um, and, um, you know, it's the marketing that makes us believe that that's what dogs need. Oh, of course they need to chase a ball. Um, every single bit of equipment that you can go and buy in these dog shops is all driven by marketing. It's all driven by us believing that's really good for a dog but it's not. Okay, so yeah, just really finishing up from uh, from an exercise point of view, and it's a good transition to go over to mental stimulation. Um, in an ideal world, walk your dog in the morning. You know, when dogs um, wake up, they've got some energy that they need to burn off. Um, burn that energy out first thing. It's always easier to work with a dog, especially if it's got behavior problems, if you can just burn that energy out in the morning. Otherwise, the energy is just you know, piling up, piling up, piling up all throughout the day. And then at the end of the day, it's much harder to work with that dog. Um, that also goes on to mental stimulation. So one of the reasons why I have a career in dog behavior is because most domestic dogs do not get the mental stimulation that they need. So let's think about them in the wild. In the wild, they'd wake up in the morning and they'd pretty much spend their whole day using their sense of smell, which is their primary sense, um, to track food. Um, dogs are very social animals, so if they come across other dogs, they'll probably have a bit of a play, and then every now and then they'd be lucky enough to mate. And that's pretty much their life. When we domesticate a dog, we take all of their jobs away from them. Um, not only do they not need to use their sense of smell to find their food anymore, but we feed them in a bowl, which some dogs inhale within 15 seconds. Uh, and some people don't even make their dog sit and wait for the food. Um, and then that dog maybe gets um, a walk if it's lucky. Um, there's a lot of dogs that I work with that aren't lucky enough to get off lead exercise because the owners just can't trust them. Um, and it's just a snowball effect. The amount of times I've been phoned up and somebody's gone, well, you know, my Cocker Spaniel comes from a really good line. It's, it comes from a working line. We actually pick them up from a farm. What mental stimulation does it get? None. Okay. So now we're wondering why we've got a dog that has got a high need to work 
is displaying behavioural problems, which could be anxiety, it could be aggression, it could be hyperactivity, it could be jumping up, it could be destruction, whatever it is. Um, so what we need to do is we need to give dogs um, jobs to do. So from a training point of view, of course, the more you can train your dog, absolutely fine, brilliant, invest the time in it. Let's be honest, not a lot of people that buy dogs understand that that dog needs that investment. So what we can do is what I call cheats mental stimulation. There is absolutely no reason why there's not a single dog on planet Earth that's domesticated, doesn't get the opportunity to do this every day of its life. So it's a simple game called Find It. What we do is I get something like some dried sprats and I break them up in each one up into four or five bits. Um, maybe I've got some chicken left over from a roast dinner. I'll shred that up, whatever it is. I go out in the garden, I chuck it all over the grass like chicken feed. I put it on different levels and bricks and stuff like that. So it's all over the garden. My dogs go out, they use their sense of smell to find all of the food. Um, and they're, what they're having to do is they're having to work for their food. Mm -hmm. Rather than giving a massive chunk of chicken to a bulldog, cut it up into 100 bits and go and get that dog to work for 20 minutes to find that whole big bit of chicken. And what happens is um, they drain a chemical in their brain, which basically calms them down. Every single morning after we've exercised our dogs, the first job that they're given is they go out in the food and they spend 20 minutes finding their food. Um, if we can't walk them on a day, we will do that breakfast, lunch and evening. Our dogs have been thinking for around about an hour. Guess what? By the evening, they're absolutely knackered and they're asleep by about six o'clock in the evening. KO'd. No exercise that day. Um, there's other things that we can do. You know, people spend a lot of money on dog toys. My advice is never buy them. Uh, there's very few dog toys which I think are relevant. Um, what I do is every time I get an Amazon box, I punch a hole through it with a knife. I like this one. I rub a bit of frankfurter in it. I tape it up with some masking tape and I chuck it on the floor. And if I'm feeling really cruel, I'll rub a bit of frankfurter in five boxes, but I will only put the frankfurter in one box. <laughs> and I'll watch my dogs work for a good 20 minutes, half an hour to rip open all the boxes. And only one of them would be lucky enough to get the food. I love that one. <laughs> I, I, chuck, I chuck Amazon boxes in the daycare all the time. It's interesting to see which dogs are actually interested in the box, but yeah, we get a lot of, I make sure the boxes are all put yeah. to good use. They're never in the recycling. They love it. It's the main thing is they're thinking. Yeah. You know, how much time does it take out of your day to go out and, and put a load of food all over the garden? Two minutes? Yeah. How much time does it take to set up an Amazon box? You know, um, and if you don't have the time to invest in the training from a mental stimulation point of view, do scent work with the dog. Find f jobs to do for that dog, um, which means that you don't have to spend a lot of time on it. Flirt pole training. A lot of people have never seen a flirt pole before. Um, brilliant to burn off exercise, especially if you've got behavioral problems and it's not getting the off lead exercise it wants amazing mental stimulation fantastic for self-control training again it's 10 15 minutes out of your day do you want to explain what what one is a flirt pole yeah so it always sounds a little bit weird when i turn around to my clients and go i'm just gonna go and get my flirt pole out of my car <laughs> <laughs> uh, people tend to look at me and go pardon especially if i'm just working with a lady yeah and i say, i'm just gonna go and get my flirt pole out of the car sarah and they kind of look at me like do I run? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do I run? Uh, a flirt pole we use for prey-driven dogs. It's basically a pole with a bungee rope and a, and a fluffy toy on the end of it. And you whiz it around in figure of eights and all the rest of it. The dog chases after it. It thinks it's a squirrel. Um, and um, you can the, if you YouTube flirt pole training, the best ones to buy are the squishy face ones. You get them on Amazon for about 25, 30 quid. Um, and um, you can have loads, hours of fun, loads of stuff you can do with them, um, and they're absolutely brilliant. Fantastic. Yeah, so uh, find it or scatter feeding, that was something I used yeah, to Yeah, scatter feeding. In the daycare, we used to we still do. We, we, we boil a chicken, dice it into pieces, choose certain dogs, uh, and, and send them out. Yeah. So they get their hour walk in the morning, lunchtime, they spend an hour and a half 
looking for the chicken and I, i'll just drip feed it in i won't put it all in at yeah once. definitely that's it so I'll, yeah you know when whenever i start doing scent work with people quite often they're, they're the owners going it's over here and i'm stop it and they're like oh no but he's it's taking he's a minute he can't look if it takes half an hour for your dog to find that bit of chicken absolutely brilliant yeah your dogs just work for half an hour to find a tiny little bit of chicken that's and, exactly what we want and the idea of looking for it and actually finding it is probably as good as the actual food itself yeah. and uh, exactly and they love it you know i mean people say that pugs don't have a scent on them rubbish go on my website um and watch kobe play and find it he does it every single day absolutely loves it all of my bulldogs have always loved going to find food out in the garden um so you know the structure of a consultation is usually without the client knowing about it we explore more into what's going on i find out what's going on from an environmental point of view we have a good conversation we take that dog out and basically what i do over an hour to a two hour period is i absolutely drill that dog from a physical and a mental point of view and then when we get back home and we're dealing with aggression separation anxiety or something like that the owners are amazed at how quickly we get results and i go it's because your dog's tired mm. yeah not just physically but mentally as well and that's why mental stimulation in dogs is so so important you know and if there's anything that, and you know that anybody takes away from this podcast please give your dogs jobs to do because they love it um, and it shapes a calmer dog, much easier dog to work with as well. Fantastic advice. Right, let's go on to a question I got from Jenny. And yeah, top three bits of advice to shape and calm, uh, shape a calm and balanced dog. So <laughs> you, yeah, one of them, I guess, would be <laughs> yeah. your mental stimulation. Yeah, definitely. Um, how do you shape a calm and balanced dog? Um, so really i suppose it goes back to caesar milan's uh love him or hate him but his uh his, his advice calm assertive leadership of course you've got the five foundations that you want to work on and i think you know a very good um story for me to tell you uh right now is uh is, is rex because um rex is our rescue dog um we took him on back in january um he was the lights were on, but nobody was home. Uh, he was an incredibly challenging dog. He'd had no training, uh, big, strong, mastiff, uh, incredibly stubborn, stressed, um, very, very prey driven. The first time he, I had him on the lead and he saw a cat, he absolutely lost the plot. I've I, honestly, hand on heart, never seen a dog react like that to a cat before. Literally bouncing up and down on the lead, all of these high pitched noises, high wagging tail. It, you know, I'm a big guy, I was struggling to, to control him. He kept trying to escape the house, uh, noticeably stressed, um, always like this when he's out on a walk. Really, really hard to get focus from him. Um, and, you know, we fast forward to six months later, we've got a really calm and balanced dog. So how did we get there? Well, the first thing we did is we ignored him for three months. So because he had all of these stress hormones in his body, um, all of this cortisol, what tends to happen when people rescue dogs, and it is a frustration of mine that rescue homes, not all rescue homes, educate people who rescue dogs in the right way for this, um, is our, it's human nature for us to go, the dog's had a really bad time, let's just love and adore them. But as these stress hormones are going out, the dog develops something which we call hero worship, um, where all of a sudden it's being fed lovely meals in a really calm and balanced environment, it's getting exercise and mental stimulation. <gasps> I want to hold on to this world. And quite often I'll get people that phone me after six to nine months because that dog has now become very anxious or very aggressive. Um, so we were kind to Rex and the kindest gift that you can give a dog like that is distance. So we had no sofa cuddles with him for three months. When we were watching the TV in the evening, we got him used to being in a ro room on his own. Uh, if he ever walked up to me for love and attention, just like his mum did at four weeks old, I pushed him away. I haven't asked you to come for attention for me. Um, you can have a love and attention and a cuddle. You can have loads of it, but it's on my say-so, and it's for short periods of time. 
Um, so we, what we do is we have a relationship with a dog just like they would have in with with a dog dog relationship with a dog, um, you know, a wild dog relationship or something like that. Um, and um, we gave calm assertive leadership. We got him on the right diet. We gave him the mental stimulation and exercise that he needed. We made sure that his environment was where it needed to be. And of course, he got the right influence from us. Now, I mean, if you saw videos of Rex seven, eight months ago, compared to now, you wouldn't believe it's the same dog. So, um, you know, in, in summary, it's calm assertive leadership. That's how we shape um, calm and balanced dogs treat that dog like a dog not a fluffy teddy bear always the biggest bit of advice that I can give um, owners um, and you know that also leads on to say that you know if you prioritize the dog uh, all of the time so I work with more couples with no children than I do families there's a very simple reason for it when a family rushes through the front door, the child's just been sick, the other kid's trying to beat up the other one, and the dog is not the priority. Yeah, bottom yeah? of the food chain. Bottom of the food chain. Guess what? I don't work with that many families. <laughs> Couples, yeah, the priority is their dog, and they yeah. come back and they idolise the dog, and they treat it like a fluffy teddy bear, and they reward a lot of the wrong behaviours. And for quite a lot of dogs, that's very damaging, and they end up with behavioural problems. So... Advice is, when you walk into a room, when you come down after you know in the morning, when you come back from being out of the house, don't make the dog the priority. Ignore the dog until the dog's calm. When the dog's calm, go over and say hello. So you know, just to wrap up the calm and balance bit, um, again, probably a another podcast that we could do on this because there is no there is no magic wand that we can that we can wave. Um, to create a calm and balanced dog. I, I know uh, a lot of the TV programs, the dog behavior programs, it looks like a behaviorist walks in, waves this magic wand, and then the dog's completely fixed. Um, it, it's not as simple as that. Um, and I suppose, you know, to prove my point in terms of, you know, really distance is one of the kindest gifts that you can give a dog. You know, training a dog that's to be comfortable in their own space and in, in a room with a door closed with you the other side of it is one of the kindest gifts you can give them because it means the dog's not stressed if they're comfortable being in that environment. So if I was to ask you, Ryan, you know, and you probably won't know the answer to this, so don't worry, but if you, um, if you were to look at social groups, what social group has the calmest and most balanced dogs out of all of us? Ah... Uh... That's hard to say, yeah. No one ever knows the answer, but it's so obvious when I say it. Uh, it's the homeless. Have you ever seen a crazy homeless dog? No, yeah, no. got me there. Yeah. So we can take a lot of inspiration from the homeless, um, and we can also ask ourselves why. Why are all their dogs so calm and balanced? It's very simple. Thousands, if not tens of thousands of people walk past that dog every day and completely ignore it. No talking, no touching, no eye contact. There is a reason why you can't pet service dogs, because we undo all of the bad work. As soon as you domesticate a dog from eight weeks old, it's a puppy, we reward all of the wrong behaviours through talking, touching and eye contact. Um, a, a, an eight-week-old Labrador that jumps up on your leg is cute. 12 months later when it does that, and it's 20, 30 kilos... Uh, it can put your 90 year old nan in hospital yeah so uh, we can take a lot of inspiration from the homeless and we can learn a lot from them um, this constant humanization and wanting to you know um, you know constantly dote over a dog doesn't shape calm and balanced dogs no i love that i really do i think it was jocko willink he's uh, uh, an american um, marine he said you know there are, there's freedom in discipline um, he's got a book called Extreme Ownership and it is very much, you know, it's about humans, but it, it, it it's very relevant. You know, yeah. you, you discipline your life and then everything after, you know, once you've done that workout, once you've done, once you, you've eaten good, everything else, you're free, you know. Um, your life is very free when you create discipline for yourself. So it, yeah. it, it directly translates to, to dogs as I soon totally as they agree. have structure. They get it, you know. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Yeah. 
So yeah, I mean, is, is your top three? Is that just that's that's it, isn't it? Yeah, really? it's calm, assertive leadership. Awesome. You know, follow that as a as 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 your kind of goal, as your mission statement in your dog owner relationship, uh, and then everything else fits in in behind that. That's cool. That's really really good. And going back to what you said earlier about having to deal with couples as opposed to families. Yeah. That issue is as a whole it's described as humanization isn't it mm -hmm. when when people humanize their dogs do you want to explain exactly what humanization is and, and why it's such a problem i know you've pretty much explained it but what exactly is humanization humanization is um i mean it's really how we've ended up with a dog like a pug it's really how we've ended up with a french bulldog um, so, um, I mean, let's start there first of all. The reason why so so many people love bulldogs, pugs, and French bulldogs is because if you actually look at the shape of their head, it's like the shape of a baby. So we have, through breeding, humanized dogs thousands of years ago before we start talking about the common types of humanization now. Um, humans are obsessed with saying things like, Oh, that chimpanzee's got the mental age of a seven-year-old. Yeah, that dog has got the mental age of a two-year-old. No, right? That dog's sense of smell is far superior to anything that humans have ever achieved. NASA have been trying to create a machine since the 60s that's better than the dog's nose. They've got absolutely nowhere near it, and I'm sure they've probably given up. Um, so what we need to do is we need to look at the dog for their strengths. We need to look at the chimpanzee and go, wow, look at that, you know, look at what it can do with its climbing. So humans are constantly going, oh, well, let's let let's look at that animal and then let's let's compare it against a human. No, let's look at the animal and see it for what the animal is and what, what the animal's needs are. Um, so, you know, even through breeding, we've done humanization because we've created dogs that we like looking at. And I think, you know, I don't have a statistic on it, but I should imagine that over 90% of dogs are picked on looks rather than um, the lifestyle need of that dog, the health of that dog and the behavior of that dog. Yes. Um, so humanization then goes on to the fact that we think that dogs need to be priority. That, of course, if you've left your dog for four hours, when you come home, you need to give it a big cuddle. Um, that that dog should sleep with you, that it should cuddle you on the sofa every night, that it should wear dog clothes, you know, that makes it human looking, that it needs a, you know, a certain type of lead with its name on it and... You know, if you actually look at, you know, most of the stuff, if you walk around one of the big, you know, um, pets at homes or something like that, it's just, it's marketed all through humanization. Um, and as a result of this humanization, and really in summary, it is treating a dog like a fluffy teddy bear rather than a dog. So small dogs, I work with more small dogs than I do big dogs. Small dogs are humanized more. Mm -hmm. They're picked up all the time. They're cuddled all the time. And that shapes behavioral problems within that dog. I work with more French bulldogs than any other breed. Um, partly because I think my logo is a bulldog. Never really thought that when I set my business up. <laughs> partly because I live in Bournemouth and it's trendy to have a French bulldog. But the main reason is because that dog is small enough to be treated like a fluffy teddy bear. And guess what? It causes a lot of them to lose the plot. Um, and when we look at a Yorkshire Terrier that's wow, 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 yapping at other dogs, uh, people find it comical, um, and the owners don't take it that seriously. But when a pit bull does it, yeah, <laughs> you worry. Yeah. Right? But what we've got to understand is that there is nothing different going on in the dog's brain. That Chihuahua or that Yorkshire Terrier, what's going on in their brain is no different to what's going on with the reactive pit bull. Um, and, you know, in terms of humanization, because more small dogs are humanized, what I say to a lot of my clients that are struggling with this is when you are dealing with your dog, I want you to pretend that it is a 50 kilo Mastiff that's aggressive. That's a good way not it, yeah. a four kilo ch chihuahua that's aggressive. Mm. What relationship would you have with a 50 kilo Mastiff if it was aggressive? And instantly people turn around and go, I'd, I'd want to sort the problem out. 
there's no difference with what's going on with the pit bull or the massive compared to what's going on with your dog. Yeah. So, you know, in summary, really, that's what humanization is. It's, it's, it's treating dogs how we believe they should be treated rather than actually treating them like a, like a wild animal. Um, and when you treat them like a wild animal, you shape a much calmer and balanced dog. And it's wild to think that, you know, for the past ten, tens of millions of years, they've been, you know, canids, wolves, uh, and, and early dogs. It's only when we took a sharp right when they started becoming domesticated. And then only recently, sort of past the Victorian era, people kind of wanted that baby almost, didn't they? So it's 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 amazing to think that this tiny little chunk of time is when all of this is really happening. And I guess behaviorists are become a thing exactly you know and um you know probably i mean i haven't got the statistics on it but i would say that the main reason why i have a career in dog behavior is driven by humanization is probably the main cause of behavioral problems in dogs mm -hmm. yeah and trends are dangerous i mean you know it's cool that doc martens have come back around again but uh as far as yeah trendy dogs it's not because you get quite young owners um getting dogs that they don't fully understand and they yeah. they, they, they treat in and ways they shouldn't you know let me let me just go back to um when i was in my early 20s young and naive and we went and picked kobe up why did we get a pug because i thought it looked cool did i do any research on pugs of course i didn't you know, we're lucky that it's a pug and they're pretty easy. Imagine if I'd have gone, oh, yeah, let me go and let me go and get Husky as my first dog. You know, let me get a Rhodesian Ridgeback or, uh, you know, a, a, an Akita. It could have been a whole different story. It could have been very much so. So we've got a couple of questions left. We've got one from John. He and his family are looking at getting a puppy. They're not exactly sure what breed to get just yet, whether they're going to try and rescue when does the training start? When do they start going to puppy training? Okay, well, that's a really good question, John. Um, and with the the knowledge that I have now, where I'm not a young, early 20s, naive person who just wants to buy a pug because I think they look cool, my advice is this. Get on the phone to a behaviorist or a dog trainer today and speak to them about your life and what you're looking for and get advice from them in terms of what breed you should have. Um, work with that behaviorist before you've even picked up the dog, you know? Um, and the training, although you're not gonna do massive amounts of training apart from toilet training with a young dog, you need to train yourself in terms of how you shape a calm and balanced dog. Every single time I work with somebody who's had a dog from puppy stage and I'm working with it 9, 12, 18 months old, they go, I wish I'd have known all of this the day we picked them up. So please contact a trainer or a behaviorist and work with them before you've even picked up the dog. Um, and in terms of uh, the type of training that you should do from day one, my biggest bit of training with a new puppy is distance. I solely believe that distance is one of the kindest gifts that you can give a puppy. Getting that dog from eight weeks old used to being on their own, in a crate in their own, in a room in their own, and being left for periods of time will massively mean that that dog is not going to be stressed later on in life. So distance really is the kindest gift that you can give a dog. Um, and unfortunately, what most of us believe is, oh, we've got a dog, let's spend as much time as we possibly can with it and let's give it loads of love and attention and reward all the wrong behaviours and all the rest of it. Uh, and unfortunately, um, that's the reason why I get called in later on in life because the dog's stressed and anxious really so that would be my advice um in terms of in terms of the training side of that that's that's great advice and the training doesn't end uh, no. it doesn't have a start it doesn't have an end you're training constantly and if you're not training the dog the, the dog is is training you like we spoke about you know a dog will come over get a stroke realizes it can every time it comes over it's going to get affection you know everything you're doing with the dog is a training exercise um exactly yeah so fantastic and our last question 
So it's from Kate. She is stuck in a corporate job and is desperately looking to get out and start working with dogs. She's been volunteering at a shelter and she's been walking a few friends' dogs, but she's not getting paid. She's not entirely sure what she wants to do with dogs. She just wants out of corporate and to be surrounded by them. What advice have you got? Okay, so again, another really good question, Kate. Um, you know, probably like me, you are right now feeling quite frustrated if you're working in a corporate world like I used to um, what we tend to do in the corporate world is we have teams we have training teams we have finance teams we have people with all of these individual strengths and then whenever you need to lean on somebody and you need to learn more you go and have a chat with them and they're really open with you and they're all part of the same business the same company the same brand and everybody's on the same journey uh, one thing that I found, um, you know, really hard coming into the, the dog world is that nobody wants to collaborate. I say nobody. Ryan, <laughs> hello. <laughs> Pay um, away. You were one of the first, you know, one of the first people, I'm not saying the first, that was like, I want to collaborate with loads of people in the industry. If there's any, if there's any mark on the industry that, that I can leave, I would love to leave this industry when I retire with more people collaborating. And I think what Kate is struggling with now is that there are people that are basically have this attitude of it's my way or the highway and I ain't telling you any of my trade secrets. Now, in leadership, that's a really bad manager because in order for you to create a highly effective company, you need to train your staff so well that they could do their job, that they could do your job better than you. And if only we had that attitude in the dog industry, we'd be in a completely different place. So, you know, I feel your pain, Kate. And I think, you know, the main thing would be to reach out to people like, you know, Ryan and myself. Uh, and really what you need to start doing is making things happen. Um, there's going to have to be a decision as to when you go, right, I'm going to break away from this and go and do that. Um, and, um, you know, talk to the relevant people that can give you the relevant advice to get there. And, you know, just be prepared that a lot of people are very secretive within the industry and they probably won't want to speak to you. But there are also some loads of amazing people like Ryan and, and a lot of the people that he's introduced me to that do want to help. So find those people and make it happen. Yeah, it can be quite overwhelming, especially going out on your own. It can be quite lonesome. And especially if you're going to set something up, whether it's going to be dog walking, uh, homeboarding. Uh, yeah, you didn't go exactly into what you wanted to go into, whether it's training. Yeah, it can be quite a solitary uh, job, you know. Whilst, whilst I do still talk to my dogs, they don't necessarily... Uh, talk back but it's um you know just, just to say in there i i remember the first time i was walking up the driveway of a house many years ago just about to knock on a on a, on the door working with a, a highly aggressive staffy going i've never done this before <laughs> <laughs> um and um you know i just wish that um i'd have been able to have somebody there just to to support me a little bit more in that's in that exactly, moment yeah. and that's what would be great to see in 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 the in the pet industry that's it hold your counsel find people um that you can rely on that you can you can turn to definitely have a support system yeah try and reach out to to people who are far more experienced than you people who offer other services that are local that you know and trust as well that you can sort of refer people to as well and start building that that network um I mean, I know you just said uh, you'd never dealt with aggression before. Try not to run before uh, before you can walk s too much. But I mean, you knew that you you knew you were you were ready. It was just a, a confidence thing. I think it, it was. I knew all the theory, and I had worked with aggressive dogs before. But I'm talking this dog was really bad. Yeah. foaming at the mouth red zone aggression type of bad. So, you know, that's where my anxiety came from. But um, you know, I went in there and, and, and actually we, we sorted that dog out in, in probably about six months. Um, and, uh, that dog's off lead now, doesn't wear a muzzle anymore and loves playing with other dogs. So, um, yeah, yeah. Don't think that I was just turning up and winging it. I was qualified. <laughs> I'd worked with aggressive dogs. I just hadn't worked with a dog at that level of aggression. Before. Yeah. But I guess now you have, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. know your strengths. 
play to them and work on your weaknesses. But yeah, a, a support system's crucial. That's something I didn't have for the first three years. I was quite, I was quite introverted and I, I did feel like I was doing it all myself, um, which, you know, slowed my progression. Yeah. And then about year three, I just made a few big changes in my life and started talking to my customers more, uh, people I would meet at different places and things just flourished. Things just started snowballing. Yeah. And I was like, oh God, but I need to do a podcast. I need to talk to these people on a, on a proper level uh, in my garage. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I think, you know, that's exactly right. And, you know, fair play for, for doing that. And look at where you are now, you know, hats off to you doing that. You know, you did the charity event the other weekend, which is great bringing people together and and obviously you're doing this podcast now which again is bringing loads of people together and and you know creating a community going forward which um is great to see and i suppose you know my only other thing to say kate is that everybody will tell you that it's their way or the highway this is the way that a dog needs to be dealt with um this doesn't work you know the amount of times that you know other people in the industry unfortunately put down work for other people doing all of the rest of it um, is um, you know it's it's not one of the great things about the industry. So my advice is learn your own way, mm -hmm. learn what works for you, and learn what gets results. You know I have so much respect for positive reward only trainers if it works. I have so much respect for um, you know for people that use other methods as long as it's humane and it works. So you know I very much like I mentioned earlier on go into everything with an open mind of going my end goal is to sort the dog out yeah and I will work with that dog in a humane way as long as the owner is comfortable with what we're doing to get the dog sorted out. That's absolutely fantastic advice Will. Um, I think we'll wrap up here you cool with that yeah fine uh where can people find you uh where can people find me so i'm based in bournemouth but um i've actually picked up clients all over the world nigeria america romania uh working with a client up in belfast at the moment i'm mainly working in around dorset i will you know do south of england but you know if, if somebody really wants to work with me and and we can make it work i'll, I'll go wherever in terms of actually finding me, um, my website is Calm Down Dog. So dog is spelled D-A-W-G, as in Calm Down Dog. <laughs> um, you can tell that I love American football and all things American and, and cooking things low and slow and brisket and all the rest of it. Uh, so www.calmdowndogdawg.com. Um, you can find me on social media if you just search Calm Down Dog, Facebook and Instagram. Um, and, uh, you know, if you want to contact me and you want to have a chat and see if we can help you out, um, then feel free to do so. It's, it's, it's my passion and, 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 and I obviously love people helping people to get to where they want to get to. Amazing. Well, thanks for listening guys. And yeah, we're going to be talking about diet in our next one, aren't we? We are indeed. Awesome. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you enjoyed the episode of the Doggy Style Podcast. If, like me, you've learned something from the guests, taken value from it, then do like, subscribe, hit that thumbs up button, drop a comment, whatever you want to do. But the most important thing to help us would be if you if you share this episode just with one person that you think would, would benefit from listening or watching it. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Just search the Doggy Style Podcast. We'll come up. There you can see sort of behind the scenes kind of thing, what we get up to. And well, till the next guest, thanks for listening. Thank you.